This is not my analysis. I quote Zev Jabotinsky, I quote Herzl, I quote every Zionist leader up to the 1940s, all of whom described their movement as a settler colonial movement that had to destroy the resistance of the indigenous population. They had no qualms about saying this. Joan Peters was a freelance journalist who developed a fascination with the Israeli-Palestinian conflicts in the 1970s and 80s. The publication of her best-selling book from Time Immemorial was an instant sensation that seemed to settle, in the minds of her Western audience at least, the debate over the rights of Palestinians to the land in Israel and Palestine. She even went on to loosely advise the Carter administration. Though met with derision in Europe from the outset, it was met with widespread critical acclaim in the United States and put Peters on the map as a serious journalist with the temerity to wade into one of the most misunderstood conflicts in human history. Her claim that there was no such thing as a Palestinian people was so forceful and backed by scholarly claims, demographic research, and firsthand reporting for refugee camps that it changed the national discourse in the United States and affirmed the claims of the Zionist movement that sought dominion over the whole of Palestine. There was only one problem. The book was a complete fabrication. UNFTR. If you've been following the conflict closely these days or have been tuned to it for a while, you may have come across the name Norman Finkelstein. Finkelstein was the first American scholar to dig into the claims made in Peter's books in his PhD dissertation at Princeton, debunking nearly all of its claims. To give you an idea of his perspective, this is a now infamous clip of Finkelstein arguing with a group of Jewish students in 2008. The Jews did not take arms against the My Germans. late father was in Auschwitz concentration camp. My late mother was in Maidana concentration camp. Every single member of my family on both sides was exterminated. Both of my parents were in the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. And it's precisely and exactly because of the lessons my parents taught me and my two siblings that I will not be silent when Israel commits its crimes against the Palestinians. And I consider nothing more despicable than to use their suffering and their martyrdom to try to justify the torture the brutalization, the dem demolition of homes that Israel daily commits against the Palestinians. So I refuse any longer to be intimidated or browbeaten by the tears. If you had any heart in you, you would be crying for the Palestinians, not for what's been done. The mere mention of Finkelstein's name enrages Zionists and pro-Israel sympathizers the world over. He was even banned from entering Israel for a decade. His PhD was delayed because he had trouble finding professors to read it critically. His career suffered as well, as he bounced around institutions failing to make tenure in any of them. Lauded in left-wing circles as a truth-telling son of Holocaust survivors and principled academic, vilified by nearly everyone else in American society as a self-loathing Jew and terrorist sympathizer. Figures like Edward Said and Noam Chomsky dug into Finkelstein's claims and uplifted his work. Others, like Alan Dershowitz and Peter Novick of UChicago, became mortal enemies. Nearly all of academia and mainstream media ultimately came to the conclusion that from time immemorial was propaganda at best. At worst, a hoax. The central conceit of the book, that the Palestinians never existed and the small number of Arabs in the territory known as modern-day Israel and Palestine, were nomadic tribes that hailed from other parts of the former Ottoman Empire, endured in pro-Israel policy circles and, more importantly, in the minds of many Americans. Both Peters and Finkelstein would wind up disgraced for different reasons surrounding the same claim. And while Finkelstein is experiencing somewhat of a resurgence on the left these days, he remains a marginalized voice and is still viewed as a traitor to Zionists. I begin with this not to surface the work of Finkelstein or any other pro-Palestinian scholar or activist, but to highlight the tension that exists in all walks of academia, activism, and punditry. Our propensity to favor propaganda over fact-checking scholarship allows false narratives to endure. Jews control the media and banks. Palestinians aren't real. 
If you're Jewish and criticize Israel, you're a self-loathing Jew. If you're not Jewish and criticize Israel, you're anti-Semitic. If you believe in Palestinian self-determination, you're a terrorist sympathizer. If you're Palestinian and believe in a two-state solution, you're a Jew sympathizer. Listening to facts and scholarship that challenges one's beliefs is difficult, and we need to allow space for as many people as possible who are willing to try. Thus, in part one, I attempted to contextualize Jewish migration to Palestine in the five Aliot in the first part of the 20th century. Similarly, the goal of this episode is to explain how the territory of Palestine developed during the same period, and how the indigenous population came to identify as Palestinians and call for self-determination. These first two level-setting episodes mostly cover the birth of the Zionist movement and the turning point of 1948. And I want to emphasize the titles of the episodes for a moment as well before we move on. Part one is titled The Jewish Question, and part two is The Palestinian Cause. The very deliberate implication of both of these titles is that both Jews and Palestinians have been viewed reflexively as modifiers in a statement, always framed as a question or a cause. There's something about this that diminishes the humanity of both groups in my mind. At the root of it, that's what I'm trying to tease out in these first two episodes, to go beyond the question or the cause, and to see the humanity in the people caught up in this most intractable conflict. Where it gets tricky, and we start walking a tightrope, is in the final episode, beginning with the events of 1948. For Jews, it marked the historic moment of official statehood. Palestinians refer to it as the Nakba, or the Great Catastrophe. But for today, the Palestinian cause. Rashid Khaldi, the Edward Said Professor of Modern Arab Studies at Columbia University, published The Hundred Years' War on Palestine in 2020, one of eight books that he's authored on the subject. The book begins with a personal family history of his great-great-great-uncle, Youssef Dia al-Khaldi, former governor of districts in Kurdistan, Lebanon, Palestine, and Syria, and mayor of Jerusalem for nearly a decade. In the lecture supporting the book, Khaldi explains that he introduced the book with this anecdote specifically for American audiences because he found Americans unique in their perspective that Zionist designs on Palestine weren't settler colonial in nature. Moreover, that they'd bought into the idea that Palestinians didn't really exist as an identity, narrative residue of Joan Peters from time immemorial. In seeking to establish the identity of the people, he uncovered the personal papers of his ancestors from the mid-1800s through the turn of the century. Among the collections of books, letters, and archival material, he found a critical correspondence between Yusef Dia and Theodore Herzl. Quote, Yusef Dia sent a prescient seven-page letter to the French chief rabbi Zadok Khan with the intention that it be passed on to the founder of modern Zionism. End quote. The letter began with an expression of Yusef Dia's admiration for Herzl, whom he esteemed as a man, as a writer of talent, and as a true Jewish patriot, and of his respect for Judaism and for Jews, and said that we're cousins, referring to the patriarch Abraham, revered as their common forefather. According to Chaldi, a portion of Yusef Dia's letter has been used in Zionist literature where he proclaimed Zionism to be, quote, natural, beautiful, and just, and, quote, who could contest the rights of the Jews in Palestine? My God, historically, it is your country. And indeed, he wrote that. But by unearthing the remainder of the correspondence, Chaldi noted that this was used to acknowledge a shared heritage and a claim to the land, but as a prelude to warn against the idea of an exclusively Jewish state. Yusef Dia follows with, quote, Palestine is an integral part of the Ottoman Empire, and more gravely, it is inhabited by others. He concludes his letter saying, nothing could be more just and equitable for the unhappy Jewish nation to find a refuge elsewhere. But in the name of God, let Palestine be left alone." End quote. Let's reflect on a couple of important points within these sentiments. The first is the notion that we expressed in part one, which is the natural and familial relationship between Jews and Arabs of greater Palestine during this period. This isn't to suggest that relations in this part of the world or any other part of the world have always been harmonious. That's a profoundly ignorant claim. However, it is accurate to suggest that for hundreds of years in Palestine, people of varying ethnic and religious backgrounds lived in relative peace. Upper classes within each group thrived economically and were highly educated. There were competent administrators from all backgrounds that worked cooperatively under Ottoman influence to govern disparate territories. 
More to the Palestine cause, there were indigenous people of the territory referred to as Palestine, composed of modern-day Syria, Jordan, Lebanon, Israel, and Palestine. Yusef Diaz's letter was somewhat prophetic in another respect. As Khaldi writes, Quote, the former mayor and deputy of Jerusalem went on to warn of the dangers he foresaw as a consequence of the implementation of the Zionist project for a sovereign Jewish state in Palestine. The Zionist idea would sow dissension among Christians, Muslims, and Jews there. It would imperil the status and security that Jews had always enjoyed throughout the Ottoman domains, end quote. This was both a fraternal and pragmatic warning, and it's almost haunting when you consider that it was written 124 years ago. Now, incredibly, Herzl responded within three weeks of receiving this letter, and his tone was just as deferential and as cordial as there's a clear respect between the two men. But his words, while intended to be reassuring, seem dismissive in retrospect. Here's Herzl. Quote, it is their well-being, their individual wealth, which we will increase by bringing in our own. In allowing immigration to a number of Jews, bringing their intelligence, their financial acumen, and their means of enterprise to the country, no one can doubt that the well-being of the entire country would be the happy result, end quote. Herzl continues later saying, quote, you see another difficulty, Excellency, in the existence of the non-Jewish population in Palestine, but who would think of sending them away? End quote. Okay, let's pause here because this is important. There are three things to unpack here, critical aspects of myth building on both sides. The first thing to note is Herzl's claim that Jewish entrepreneurship and acumen would economically enhance the region and therefore all who live there. Now, if we go back to part one and reflect on the economic development of Palestine during the first three Aliyot, the sentiment rings true. The Jewish people brought important cultural and economic innovations to the region that helped foster its growth. Of this, there can be no doubt. It's also true that like the colonial experience in the Americas, the indigenous populations passed on agricultural knowledge that helped facilitate this growth. See, it was a dynamic relationship that often inured to the benefit of both cultures. As we also learned, however, as Jewish immigration intensified, one of the aims of the more modern Zionists was to break free of the reliance on Arab labor. This also happened, so the benefits to the local population were as real as they were temporary. Especially as the Jewish National Fund, the British Empire, and other Zionist organizations began to pour wealth into the region. These capital inflows throughout the 1920s in particular exceeded 100% of the GDP for the region and allowed for extraordinary economic growth, while the newly formed Arab states surrounding Palestine floundered under the imperial rule of France and Britain. Then there's the language that Herzl uses, in allowing immigration to a number of Jews. The tacit implication here is that there was already a structure in place to allow for Jewish settlement. In other words, there was already a local population in charge of regional administrative rule. Contrast this with the notion that Palestine was barely populated by non-native Bedouins in tents, and a clear tension emerges. But it's Herzl's last point that stands out the most, especially because it was volunteered to Yusef Dia. In his letter to Herzl, Yusef Diyad never raised the idea of displacement. And yet Herzl wrote, who would think of sending them away? This may seem trivial, but when Herzl's letters and diary were published after his death, this sentiment expressed in his diary four years prior to his correspondence with Yusef Diyad paints a different picture. Quote, we must expropriate gently the private property on the estates assigned to us. We shall try to spirit the penniless population across the border by procuring employment for it in the transit countries, while denying it employment in our own country. The property owners will come over to our side. Both the process of expropriation and the removal of the poor must be carried out discreetly and circumspectly." End quote. Herzl visited Palestine only once during his lifetime and passed away in 1904. But as he's considered the father of Zionism, we must acknowledge both the impact of this sentiment and its strategic importance. While the Zionist project would be carried out by others over time, the idea that the indigenous people of Palestine would henceforth be considered simply non-Jewish people persisted and would be reinforced in the public consciousness from the Balfour Declaration through from time immemorial a concept that endures to this day. They were Muslims, Jews, and Christians. 
Bedouins, farmers, merchants, fighters, administrators, clerics, and educators. Persians, Arabs, Ottomans, Jews. For thousands of years, the territory they inhabited was known by many names. The Caliphate, the Levant, the Fertile Crescent, the Ottoman Empire, Palestine. Home to the ancient cities of Jerusalem, Bethlehem, Mecca and Medina, Hebron and Damascus. But what of the people? Chaldi said, quote, My grandfather's generation would have identified in terms of family, religious affiliation, and city or village of origin. They would have been proud speakers of Arabic, the language of the Quran, and heirs to Arab culture. They might have felt loyalty to the Ottoman dynasty and state, an allegiance rooted in custom as well as a sense of the Ottoman state as a bulwark defending the lands of the earliest and greatest Muslim empires, lands coveted by Christendom since the Crusades." End quote. A people who identified with history, religion, family, and language, and like every other person in the world, they would soon be swept up by the changing tide and hurricane winds of industrialism. As we said in part one, this part of the world was slower to feel the effects of industrialization, but it wasn't completely immune to it. Just prior to the post-Napoleonic period, while Europe's economy was rapidly expanding, the Ottoman Empire was in one of its waning periods. Writes James Galvin, quote, The Ottoman government's authority throughout the empire was increasingly challenged by local warlords. Two warlords of note emerged in Palestine. A warlord of Bedouin origin, Zahir al-Umar, took control over the Galilee region and established a principality with its capital at Acre. Further north, a former slave from Egypt, Ahmad Pasha al-Jazar, took control over the port in Sidon, present-day Lebanon, and established a principality that stretched into southern Syria." End quote. Eventually, the Ottomans settled the dispute by intervening on the side of al-Jazar, who established the cotton trade throughout Palestine. With the demand for cotton on the rise, this positioned certain cities in the region to join newly established trade routes in the fast modernizing world, and led to the buildup of the cities in Acre, in Galilee, down through Jaffa, known today as Tel Aviv. The Arabs in the cotton trade would experience the same boom and bust cycles as their European counterparts, especially when the cotton trade took off in the United States. But the interruption of the Civil War in the fledgling U.S. allowed for the markets in these trade ports to remain competitive at a critical time of development. Again, Galvin, quote, The expansion of a market economy in Palestine enlarged what one historian calls the social space of its inhabitants, in effect changing their perception of their lived world as links between cities and countryside and between inhabitants of the region and inhabitants of the world beyond increased in number and importance. The expansion of personal horizons in Palestine, along with the appearance of an increasingly complex division of labor uniting the inhabitants there, was one factor that contributed to the diffusion of a culture of nationalism." End quote. These are important factors to consider through a modern lens that often casts this region as entirely backward and the people nomadic. Furthermore, as we noted in Part 1, the governance of these territories took a more outward stance during the Egyptian occupation under Mehmed Ali. Forces from the south, or northern Africa, would battle for hegemony with European empires that sought to lay claim to the fertile territories and ancient cities of Greater Palestine from this point forward. A passage from the Studies in Economic and Social History of Palestine authored by Roger Owen in 1982 sheds further light on the economic activity of this time. Quote, Alexander Schloch's European penetration in the economic development of Palestine 1856 to 1882 makes a number of interesting points. Foremost among them is Palestine's remarkable economic upswing prior to the beginning of substantial European colonization in 1882. Palestine's agricultural production and import-export trade activity grew, as did its towns and urban production. Much of this growth was a response to increasing European interest in the country. But European demand is not the full explanation, since internal Ottoman markets, including Egypt, also stimulated production of Palestinian agricultural and manufactured goods. Schloch calculates that Palestine had a trade surplus in most of the 1856 to 1882 period, counting foreign and intra-Ottoman trade together." End quote. So when you consider that this territory of the Ottoman Empire had a trade surplus that contributed to the growth and development of both cities and rural areas as connection points, it illustrates two things. One, independent of European imperial exploits, this region had already joined the industrial age and was economically independent. And two, the sudden interest on the part of imperialists makes even more sense when one understands the strategic importance of a developing market economy and mature trading routes 
based in port cities. Palestine, with Jerusalem as its beating heart, experienced the same economic development as other formerly feudal territories in the world, and with this came similar societal upheaval and changes. The emergence of classes, different industries took hold, port cities blossomed, trade routes and passages were carved through vast desert expanses to connect bustling marketplaces. The trajectory of Greater Palestine tracks with that of Europe, and like Europe, it was about to confront an existential challenge in World War I that changed the course of human existence. Before the Great War, the people of Palestine didn't question who they were, they just were. They were inhabitants of Palestine who identified by their family name, village, religion, and language. It's a strange thing to think about today. Palestinian Arabs, Jews, and Muslims understood their differences on religious grounds, but in all other ways, they shared an identity. Prior to the war, and even with the influx from the first Aliyot, Jewish people made up about 7% of the population in modern-day Israel-Palestine. Arab Jews and the newer Sephardic and Ashkenazi settlers were fully assimilated into Palestinian culture, economy, and governance. But word of Zionist intent to foster mass migration and carve out an independent administrative state began to worry some of the occupants of the region. In my research, I wasn't able to concretely correlate a figurehead of the Palestinian movement to what Theodore Herzl would come to mean to the Zionist movement. This is due to the differences between ruling factions of the vast territories of the Ottoman Empire. While the nucleus of the empire was Istanbul, there were pockets of power and influence spread among a few ruling families. There's one figure who deserves some attention, though, from this period. Hussein bin Ali al-Hashimi is considered by many to be the father of pan-Arab nationalism. Remember that coming into World War I, the Ottomans sided with the Central Powers because of the close ties to the Balkan region. But as the fighting wore on and it became clear that not only would the Allied powers prevail, the Ottoman rule was about to come to a close, and the Western Imperial powers were devising plans to carve up the Arab territories. In the midst of the war, Hussein and others led a revolt against the Turks and declared Arab independence from the Ottomans. Behind this bold maneuver was the promise of support from the British to back the founding of an Arab nation that incorporated modern-day Syria to the Arabian Peninsula. Not shockingly, the British had already sold the Arabs down the river with the backroom deal of Sykes-Picot, thus infuriating Hussein and the Arab leaders. Again, there's this idea that the Arabs of this part of the world were unwilling to negotiate with European powers and the Zionists and therefore looked disorganized and factionalized. Now, there's an element of truth to this with respect to the territory on the peninsula, or modern-day Saudi Arabia, but for the most part, there was general alignment behind the concept of an Arab nation among Arabs, at least. But let's talk about the exception, because it all happened quickly and had lasting consequences. Abdulaziz bin Abdul Rahman al Saud, known as Ibn Saud, was an Arab leader who first led a revolt against the Ottoman Turks in alliance with the British during the war. But Hussein of the Hashemite dynasty had simultaneously led a revolt against the Turks in the areas of the Hejaz, or western Saudi Arabia, Transjordan, and Damascus as well. He too worked in concert with the British. Hussein, who had proclaimed himself caliph over the consolidated territories, was shortly thereafter run out of the peninsula by Ibn Saud, founder of the House of Saud and the first king of Saudi Arabia. So for practical purposes, we can kind of take Saudi Arabia out of the pan-Arab nationalism equation and focus on the area of the Levant. Here's where our Arab and Zionist correlation gets a bit tighter. One of Hussein's sons was Faisal bin al-Hussein bin Ali al-Hashemi, whom I'll simply refer to as Faisal. Faisal would eventually become the king of Iraq. Faisal was really well-liked and far more modern than his famous father. During the war, he became close friends with one of the most enduring figures, at least in Western literature, throughout the Western world. T.E. Lawrence, a.k.a. Lawrence of Arabia. Lawrence became a fixture in Faisal's world, and through his diaries and books on the period, he offered a remarkable glimpse into the negotiations prior to and at the Paris Peace Conference. Now listen, T.E. Lawrence, Lawrence of Arabia, is a little bit of a troubling figure because it was kind of a double agent, but the words at least do give Western people some insight into what was going on. And I mean, the double dealing that went on at this conference, the feuds and the mistrust among the Allied powers, makes for fascinating reading. Anyway, 
Faisal led the Arab delegation in Paris and brought a more Western and modern interpretation than even his father was aware of. Faisal's aim was a unified Arab nation, much in the vision of his father, but certain concessions in his back pocket depending upon where these certain alliances fell. With the help of Lawrence, they repeatedly pushed for a seat at the table, only to be rebuffed or placated while the real dealings happened behind closed doors. By this time, it was known that the British were in support of the Zionist declaration of a Jewish homeland in Palestine. It was also understood that the British intended to rule over most of the Arab world. So they were concerned on two fronts. One, that the Sykes-Picot Agreement would hold and the territories of the Levant would be unceremoniously splintered, and two, that the area of Palestine would go exclusively to the Jewish people. This would leave the Arabs in this part of the world divided and split between Jewish, French, and British rule. To ward off this potential consequence, Lawrence laid out the Arab case to the British in advance of the conference in an attempt to appeal to the British ego. Quote, in Palestine, the Arabs hope that the British will keep what they have conquered. They will not approve Jewish independence for Palestine, but will support, as far as they can, Jewish infiltration if it is behind a British as opposed to an international facade. If any attempt is made to set up the international control proposed in the Sykes-Picot Agreement, Faisal will press for self-determination in Palestine and give the moral support of the Arab government to the peasantry of Palestine to resist expropriation." End quote. Lawrence was willing to reveal Faisal's hand even if it ran afoul of his father Hussein and ran contrary to the secret deals made during the war. In their estimation, the British had the strongest hand and most experience in the region. Unfortunately for the Arabs, the British, the French, the Zionists, House of Saud, and Americans all had different ideas about the fate of the region. In an effort to counter the Zionist narrative of an exclusively controlled Jewish state, Faisal himself submitted a memorandum to the peace conference pushing for self-determination among the people of Palestine, saying, quote, In Palestine, the enormous majority of the people are Arabs. The Jews are very close to the Arabs in blood, and there is no conflict of character between the two races, end quote. Faisal and Lawrence were trying to demonstrate that not only would the Arab Jews in Palestine be secure in this land, but Jewish migrants would as well, and that it could be accomplished in a new Arabic nation state that incorporated Jewish, Muslim, and Christian Arabs and gave them what he called representative local administration. After Theodore Herzl, the most significant founding father of the Zionist movement, is a man named Chaim Weissman. Weissman became the leading figure of Zionism after Herzl and eventually was elected the first president of Israel. In yet another fascinating bit of history, Lawrence wrote an account of a meeting between Weissman and Faisal, for which he acted as interpreter. According to Lawrence biographer Jeremy Wilson, quote, Both leaders were now in a position to help one another politically. The Zionists needed Arab acquiescence to their program in Palestine while Faisal knew that Jewish support during the peace conference might help to swing American opinion behind his cause. Lawrence had already impressed upon Faisal the potential value of Jewish capital and skills. According to his own contemporary account, Weizmann assured Faisal that the Zionists in Palestine should be able to carry out public works of a far-reaching character and the country would be so improved that it would have room for four or five million Jews without encroaching on the ownership rights of Arab peasantry. Faisal replied that it was curious that there should be friction between Jews and Arabs in Palestine. There was no friction in any other country where Jews lived together with Arabs. He did not think for a moment that there was any scarcity of land in Palestine. The population would always have enough, especially if the country were developed, end quote. The two men, leaders of movements yet without nation states, even entered into a treaty known as the Faisal Wiseman Agreement. Here are some of the highlights. A Palestinian constitution that incorporates the Balfour Declaration to, quote, encourage and stimulate immigration of Jews into Palestine on a large scale and as quickly as possible. Freedom of religion. Define boundaries between states defined by a joint commission. A survey of economic development possibilities between the two territories. Now, you might be struck by the first note, incorporation of the Balfour Declaration. It's important to understand what Faisal was agreeing to here in collaboration with Weizmann. Faisal was already seeding the idea of a Jewish state, one that was agreed upon, however, by Jewish and Arab parties, not European ones. The Jewish state would live side by side with an Arab state that likely incorporated what we know as the West Bank through Golan Heights, Lebanon, Jordan, Syria, and Iraq. 
It's quite possible that the Jewish territory contemplated by Wiseman and Faisal could have been even more substantial than what it is today, though it's difficult to say. Whatever it was, both men were so in favor of it, they submitted it jointly to the Peace Commission. By this time, Faisal had already established an administrative council in Damascus as sort of a kingdom in waiting. Yet despite Faisal and Lawrence's attempts to be heard in Paris, an agreement at the ready with the Zionist movement and an Arab population desirous of self-determination, the European allies ignored all of them, and things quickly dissolved. As Khaldi writes, quote, many Palestinians hoped their country would become the southern part of this nascent state. However, France claimed Syria for itself on the basis of the Sykes-Picot Agreement, and in July 1920, French troops occupied the country. Following a bitter clash with Allied occupying forces, the nucleus of a Turkish Republic arose in Anatolia in place of the Ottoman Empire. Meanwhile, Britain failed to impose a one-sided treaty on Iran and withdrew its occupation forces in 1921. France established itself in Syria and Lebanon after crushing Emir Faisal's state. Egyptians revolting against their British overlords in 1919 were suppressed with great difficulty by the colonial power, which was finally obliged to grant Egypt a simulacrum of independence in 1922. Something analogous occurred in Iraq, where a widespread armed uprising in 1921 obliged the British to grant self-rule under an Arab monarchy headed by the same Amir Faisal, now with the title of king. Within a little more than a decade after World War I, Turks, Iranians, Syrians, Egyptians, and Iraqis all achieved a measure of independence, albeit often highly constrained and severely limited. In Palestine, the British operated with a different set of rules." End quote. In the early 1900s, there were major newspapers such as al Carmel and Haifa and Philistine and Jaffa that began to refer to indigenous Arabs as Palestinians and the territory as Palestine. It was an identity forged in resistance from the start, first to European imperialism and then to Zionism. Each passing year, the bond of the Palestinian Arabs increased, connected at the roots by culture, language, and economic activity, then resistance to control and war. As Khaldi writes, quote, just like Zionism, Palestinian and other Arab national identities were modern and contingent, a product of late 19th and 20th century circumstances, not eternal and immutable, end quote. Throughout the decade following the Treaty of Versailles, only Palestinians found themselves as a people without a nation, Jews and Arabs alike. Even while new nation states like Transjordan and Syria were ripped out of the pan-Arab nationalist movement, Arab leaders continued to press for independence and self-determination rather than the arbitrary constructs of Clemenceau and Lloyd George's pens. Again, Khaldi. Quote, their most notable effort was a series of seven Palestine Arab Congresses planned by a countrywide network of Muslim Christian societies and held from 1919 to 1928. These Congresses put forward a consistent series of demands focused on independence for Arab Palestine, rejection of the Balfour Declaration, support for majority rule, and ending unlimited Jewish immigration and land purchases. The Congresses established an Arab executive that met repeatedly with British officials in Jerusalem and in London, albeit to no avail. It was a dialogue of the deaf. The British refused to recognize the representative authority of the Congresses or its leaders." End quote. The Arabs of the region had already been administering vast territories under Ottoman rule. The mechanics of governance was hardly a foreign concept, and many of the Arab leaders were multilingual academics who had studied all throughout Europe. They were both steeped in Arabic culture and tradition, and skilled in European diplomacy and statecraft. Congress after Congress gathered each year to craft policy documents and entreaties to the French and British to consider a range of reforms from the establishment of Greater Syria to codifying the language of the Balfour Declaration. On the latter point, the Arab Congresses were still signaling a desire to absorb Jewish migrants into Palestine so long as Arabs weren't displaced or their independence compromised. And each year, they were ignored, even while tensions between Jewish immigrants and Palestinians began to mount. In 1920, anti-Zionist riots broke out in Jerusalem. In 1921, they broke out in Jaffa, all in response to land purchases by the Jewish National Fund and settlement expansions thereafter. Significant figures of resistance began to emerge that wholly adopted the Palestinian identity. Figures such as Iz al-Din al-Qassam, a religious leader who helped lead a revolt against the French in Syria. Al-Qassam formed a group known as the Black Hand, a militant group designed to expel Zionists and the British from Palestine. 
Al-Qassam was killed by the British in 1935, turning him into one of the first militant Palestinian resistant fighters and martyrs. In fact, the militant wing of Hamas is named in his honor. There were notable scholars such as Isa al-Safri, one of the most popular writers of the time, and the first to publish Palestinian history of the British Mandate, or Musa Kazim Husseini, who served a term as mayor of Jerusalem and presided over the Third and Fourth Arab Congresses. Al-Safri took a more hardline stance against British occupation and Jewish migration, rejecting the Balfour Declaration in the Third Arab Congress and the Zionist claims in the Fourth. His activism was more than political. At the age of 80, he led a demonstration in Jaffa in 1933 to stop Arab land transfers, but was struck by a British officer and died from his wounds thereafter. The point is there were influential public figures imbued with a sense of Palestinian nationalism and identity. By now, the world was becoming aware of the growing tensions between the indigenous Arabs and their imperial rulers. Moreover, as the world approached the Nazi era and life in Europe was getting increasingly difficult and precarious for Jews, prominent figures began to take up the Zionist cause. One of the most widely circulated articles from this time was a letter to the editor of Palestinian newspaper Philistine in 1930 from Albert Einstein, in which he wrote, quote, I believe that the two great Semitic peoples, each of which has in its way contributed something of lasting value to the civilization of the West, may have a great future in common and that instead of facing each other with barren enmity and mutual distrust, they should support each other's national and cultural endeavors and should seek the possibility of sympathetic cooperation, end quote. Not even Einstein could conceive of an equation that would satisfy the interests of all those involved in the region. As the 1930s wore on, the Great Depression took a toll on the world. The Nazi Party began making life unbearable for German Jews in their push for Judenrein, and it was clear that Europe was on the precipice of yet another massive conflict. Lesser known to Westerners is the explosion of Arab nationalism in Palestine between 1936 and 1939 among the laboring class. The revolts took the form of general strikes and caught the bourgeois Palestinians, Zionist settlers, and the British by complete surprise. The British responded in typical British brutal fashion under the command of Lord Peel, who, quote, expelled 200,000 Arab Palestinians as a result, writes Khalidi and declared a path forward that would place Palestinian Arab territories under the control of Jordan. The Palestinian people finally had enough, and they revolted against the British in a lopsided affair that saw 15% of the adult male Arab population killed, end quote. There was another consequence of the Arab revolts from 36 to 39 that isn't talked about as much, but once again leaves you with that what-if feeling. In May of 1939, the British published a new white paper that declared the British obligations to the Jewish national home as, quote, substantially fulfilled, and that, quote, within the next five years, no more than 75,000 Jews would be allowed into the country, after which Jewish immigration would be subject to Arab acquiescence, land transfers would be permitted in certain areas, but restricted and prohibited in others to protect Palestinians from landlessness, and an independent unitary state would be established after 10 years, conditional on favorable Palestinian-Jewish relations, end quote. It was a stunning turn of events, considering it was only two years after the Peel Commission recommended the first partition plan for the creation of two separate states. While Europe descended into complete and utter chaos and other world powers entered the fray, this was how the British retreated in the critical year of 1939. By this time, there was a splinter among Zionists between the labor wing and the land wing, represented by young militants such as Menachem Begin and politicians like David Ben-Gurion, respectively. Both men would eventually ascend to the role of prime minister of Israel, but they represented markedly different visions. Likewise, Arab leadership would fracture with different factions attempting to gain independence of their newly created territories, while others still sought to unite them. As the Nazis engaged in genocidal campaign, as the Nazis engaged in a genocidal campaign throughout the European continent and the Arab leaders fought for independence, territorial borders hardened and attitudes calcified. For the better part of a decade, the world had lost its humanity. And from the ashes, a new world order would emerge, but again leave open both the Jewish question and the Palestinian cause.